Thank you, Andy. It's always good to hear a witty, uh, entertaining, and informative uh, introduction. That's why I wrote that for Andy. <laughs> Andy was telling me a story a wee while ago on the golf course. I was only half listening, so I was concentrating on my game. Unlike Andy, he knew it was a Saturday because Tracy had baked the cakes that were ready for the boys. But he was telling me this story about uh, the kilt, and we can see him tonight resplendent in his Highland regalia, looking the part. Uh, but it used to bring a wee bit of fear and trepidation to Cara and Lewis. It got to the stage where Lewis was pleading with his dad, please dad, don't wear the kilt. Cara was convinced they had an allergy to the kilt, because every time he wore the kilt, the following day, it was dying. <laughs> I now know too much red wine. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. President, top table guests, uh, Alloway Bunce Club members, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be invited here tonight to deliver the immortal memory to our bard, Robert Burns. Firstly, I'd like to congratulate the Alloway Burns Club on our 100th anniversary, 100 years of being a member of the Burns Federation and just to acknowledge the good work that they do in promoting Burns in our community uh, and beyond. It's, uh, it doesn't matter how often you come here, it's just such a tremendous setting that we have here tonight for our Burns Supper to be surrounded by the history of Robert Burns with the, the Brigadoon, the Monument, the old Valerie Kirk, the new Robert Burns Birthplace Museum, the cottage, uh, the old clay biggin that was built by his father, William Burness's own hands, when he was setting up home for uh, him and his wife, Agnes Brun, or Nessie, as she, as she was known. Uh, it's, uh, I think, very fitting and apt that we're here tonight to celebrate the life and works of Robert Burns, a man who was born into poverty on the 25th of January, 1759, and who died on the 21st of July, uh, 1796, age 37, in bed, worn out by hard work and illness, and yet still in relative uh, poverty. Robert Burns was a, a poet, a musicologist, a socialist, a nationalist, an internationalist, a tenant farmer. Uh, he was a genius, some might say, and a prolific collector of music and song. It seems strange that no other writer, author, poet, anywhere in the world has a ceremonial night like we're having tonight. Uh, it's quite remarkable. So what is it that makes our bard so special? Well, I certainly never found them particularly special at Heathfield Primary as a young boy when the Burns competition came around. Usually a mix of fear and trepidation, worried I'd get my lines wrong. But then at the centre of educational excellence, Main Home Academy. <laughs> Who's laughing? <laughs> School of Hard Knocks. Uh, we had we just study a piece of Burns, Tamashan, and we had a magnificent teacher, Mr. Johnson, Davis Johnson, sadly no longer with us, but he was a real Burnsian, a Burns enthusiast. He was a thespian, he was into his amateur dramatics, and he brought Tamashant to life in the classroom like no other. Uh, he turned this into a kind of one-man theatre with unlimited energy and passion for his subject. He had this eaten out the palm of his hand. Uh, to be honest, I think it was January. It wasn't on the syllabus. He was probably doing lots of bomb suppers. Uh, and he was practicing, but we loved him. He was brilliant. He was just a great uh, raconteur. Uh, I'm just working out where I am here. It's always good to believe notes I'm missing up out. Uh, Burns himself, it was one of his favourites, was Tamashanta. And he indicated uh, that I look at Tamashanta as my standard performance in the poetical line. Well, what a standard he was setting. It's just a magical tale. Uh, Burns paints uh, pictures with words, it's quite cinematic, uh, and I think we'll, uh, I'll give you a wee excerpt of uh, Tamashanta. So picture the scene, we're in a warm bar. <coughs> we are pals. But to a tale, a market night, 
Tom had got planted. I'm correct. Fast by an angle. Please and finally, we're immense facts. I drank divinely. And at his elbow, suit up Johnny. <laughs> his ancient, twisty, gruffy crony, Tom Lord of my cafe, brother. <laughs> I've been through for weeks together. <laughs> The night we on with signs and clatter, and I, the ale, was growing better. The landlady in town grew gracious, with favours sweet, sweet and precious. The sir told these queerest stories. The landlords laughed. <laughs> it was ready chorus. The storm with the mick, rare and rustle. Tom didn't they mind the storm a whistle. Care, mad, to see a man so happy. Who Groomed himself among the nappy. As beastly hate will leave the treasure, the minutes wing their way with pleasure. Kings may be blessed, but Tam was glorious. Over all the hills of life victorious. The bulls managed to capture the hearts and minds of people from here, all the way to Atlanta. From here, from there, a tune surpasses for honest men and Thank you, thank you. Uh, to Abilene, Australia. From Tabouton to Tokyo. Mockland to Moscow. From Fries to Dubai. Drungen to Dusseldorf. Partner to the Punjab. <laughs> from where the sun, from where the sun uh, rises in the east to where it sets in the west. There'll be thousands of people that come tonight and for many, many days beyond, who will be basically reciting the poems of Burns, singing the songs of Burns, uh, telling the tales, enjoying the haggis, and getting food and unka happy. Talking of getting food and unka happy, my wife is not at the top table with me tonight, so I'd just like the people maybe at the, her table or across there, just keep a wee eye on her. You know, at that age, it's not a good look, you know, a wee bit of food when you're at that age. <laughs> Check out the court of Watland handbag. <laughs> I caught uh, Pauline the other day, and this is why she's part of the reason she's not with me at the top table. Uh, she was kind of looking out the window, she's going through the window, you know. There was a kind of wistful, pathetic look, is probably what I was saying. But I tell you, see, after half an hour, I think, I put my chair up, I tell that in, and I said, hey, <laughs> I said, that snow and ice is not going to shift to the woman. <laughs> but Burns, getting back to Burns, that's what it's all about. He lived, he was only 37. Uh, he wrote over 300 songs. He wrote hundreds of letters, an awful lot to his Nancy. Uh, and they wrote countless uh, poems. He always had to work as a mother, never as, as his dream as a writer. It was only later on in life, when he was ill down in the feast, that he could devote any time to his songs. It was almost like there was kind of two lives. One as the kind of tenant farmer, the worker, and the other as the avid reader, the writer, the poet, the songster. Uh, considering Burns started in the farm at the age I started Heathfield Primary School, and he became the principal farm labourer at the age of 15. And when you look at that uh, legacy of work, that canon of work that he's left behind as a legacy, he must have had one hell of a work ethic. You know, it's been said before that he was a workaholic, not an alcoholic, or some sort of sex addict. However, there's no doubt he'd be an eye for the masses, and a wee drift for the Japanese. And there's Kaba. <laughs> the baby. But his boss, when he was later in life down in the feast of the excise, Mr. Finn later, when asked about his prodigious drinking, he indicated that it had been over uh, amplified and exaggerated. <laughs> in Hubert Dermot's long, long diatribe about all things Scottish, and I love the title, A Drunk Man looks at a thistle. That's a classic. He states, mere nonsense has been uttered in his name than in Oney's barren liberty in Christ. 
Too many people have got this picture of Burns as this celebrity. He was a celebrity. Uh, but always, you know, we are drinking the hand, chasing the lasses, been very successful with the lasses, uh, but still always been able to turn out these amazing riffs of poetry and song, uh, been able to perform in public uh, before dying young due to the excesses in his lifestyle. To me, Burns deserves immortality almost for one song alone, Old Lang Syne. Uh, it's up there as the most popular songs of all time in the English language. It heralds in the new year around the globe, not just here in Scotland. Uh, it's appeared in over 170 Hollywood movies, from When Harry Met Sally to Sex in the City. And that's got nothing to do with Rabbi and his time with Old Ricky. That would still to be made. To It's a Wonderful Life, the classic Christmas movie. Uh, it's just, a, you know, it's incredible. Uh, Old Lang Syne is also played partly at uh, graduations in Japan, shops close, which is incredible. And there's a hand, my trusty here, and he's a hand of mine. And we'll take a right good valley walk for Old Lang Syne. I think to get a true picture of the man, you've got to delve down a wee bit deeper into the life and times of our bard. In 1707, 31 commissioners of Scotland took part in negotiating the Act of Union, where the parliaments were joined together. Uh, many saw this, including Burns, as Scotland was sold down the river for English gold. He wasn't wrong. The last major land battle in Britain was fought just 13 years before the birth of Burns on the 16th of April. 1746 at Culloden Moor, where an exhausted, starving Scottish army made up of mainly Highlanders, Camerons, <laughs> were called to arms to support Charles Edward Stuart's claim to the Scots throne. And our boys took one hell of a beating. We were gubbed. The Duke of Cumberland, the butcher, tore us apart. Uh, this was worse than Frank Haffey as well, mate, of uh, 63 or any truck to twicking on over the last 20 years. However, if that wasn't bad enough, at that time, Scotland watched on powerless as the Highlands were being systematically cleared. Burns called these evil days. Again, he wasn't wrong. Yet, and here's the irony, at that time, the 18th century is known as the Great Scottish Enlightenment. James Watt had invented the steam engine in Bernstein. A guy called Henry Mackenzie wrote a book, A Man of Feeling, A Man of Feeling. Yet, at that time, in Mackenzie's own land, we had poverty, starvation, brutality, persecution. Adam Smith wrote the book, uh, The Wealth of Nations, held up as a masterpiece of economic thinking and understanding. Yet, Burns wrote that it was real. He was half mad, half fed, half sarky. Basically, he was worried about his mental health. He couldn't feed and clothe himself. Burns knew poverty. He knew hard times. In those days, everyone went to church twice on a Sunday. The church was effectively the police, the law of the land. You could be put in the stocks and fined for digging up some tatties on a Sunday for your dinner. A wee bit of kiss and cuddle, slam and tickle down the shore, I would land you in my own bother. Three times on sat at the cutty stool, below the minister in the pulpit facing the congregation, where the minister based his sermon upon his sins. However, Burns was a devout Christian, he was a reader of the Bible, a huge part of that would be influence from his father, but there's no doubt he was a philanderer. And he did like a drink. And all these elements are kind of brought together in Holy Willie's prayer, uh, which deals with things like church hypocrisy, uh, lust, jealousy, and religion. And who else but Burns could brew such a kind of heady cocktail? So here's a wee bit of Holy Willie's facial, Holy Willie's prayer. Burns is uh, pointing a kind of satirical finger at uh, Willie Fisher. Uh, Elder in the Wapner Parish Church. O Lord, thou canst what zeal I bear, 
when drink is drink and sweet is sweet, we're singing here and dancing there, we're great and small, for I am keep by thy fear, free from them all. But yet, O oh Lord, confess I must, at times I'm fashly, fleshly lust, and sometimes too in worldly trust, thy own self gets in, but thou remembers, we are dust, defiled with sin. O oh Lord, this dream thou canst we make, thy pardon I sincerely beg, O oh, may it never be a living plague to my dishonour, and I'll never lift a lawless leg again upon it. Besides, uh, I fill him on a voo with uh, Lazy's lass. Three times I threw, but, but Lord, that Friday, I was, I was through when I came near her. Or else thou, or, or else thou kens, thy servant threw, would never steer her. At oh. primary school, I remember we had this amazing teacher, Mrs. Stoby. What a teacher she was. She stays down in the school, still going. She was a great teacher. And we used to have this, uh, she, she installed a kind of pride and a passion in our town. Maybe South Ayrshire Council should maybe have a wee look with her. You know, maybe we'll have a consultancy fee, they're quite good at that. Or maybe get the sleepy bill and go down and see her. I don't know. <laughs> However, uh, with this competition, every Friday, and I loved it, there was a great competition. I wanted to win this competition. And this week there was quotations. And if you won the competition, you could say, oh, well, it was great. Uh, it was a brilliant competition. I was up for it. She wasn't a very good person. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owned by so many to so few. Oh, and you. <laughs> and up. Julian. Julian. Oh, Jesus. Julian. Uh, I believe that was Sir Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill. At the end of the Battle of Britain, Second World War. Correct, Julian. Now, have you got your bag? Have you got your coat? Where you go, and we'll see you in Monday. Ah, must be happy. Next, we'll give you another one. Ask not what your country can do for you, but ask, what can you do for your country? Oh, you're a dancer, and you're hand up again. Nigel. Nigel. <laughs> uh, I, I believe that is John uh, Jim Kennedy, JFK, during his inauguration speech on becoming President of the United States of America. It is indeed. <laughs> you get back in Jack. There you go. <clears throat> so I'll give you one more. Celtic, European champions, 1967. Domestic double. Running away with the league, still in Europe. <laughs> Are we scared of them? Are we scared of them? Oh, no. My team will be taking the game to them, and they should not underestimate my team. Stuart, Malone, Murphy, Fleming, Quinn, Mitchell, Young, Ferguson, Ingram, McCulloch, Ruff, Substitute, Hood. Oh, the whole class knew. Far from the top. <laughs> Terrence. Terrence. Oh, I believe that's, that's how he would cloud that Bobby and all his friends are fixated about getting these. It is indeed. Have you got your jacket? Got your bag? Where you go? Well, that wasn't happening. Terrence, Julian, Nigel. I talked to my pal Tommy and I said, Tommy, where are all these English bastards coming from? <laughs> he said, she said, who said to that? I said, Bonnie Prince Charlie, 1746. <laughs> <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is that we were becoming anglicised. We were losing our language, our heritage, our culture. Scotland needed a voice. We needed a hero, we needed a champion. And then along came Burns, getting known in Ayrshire first by his aim folk as a maker of rhyme, and then with the Kilmarnock edition, poems strictly in a Scottish dialect, published in 1786, and then with the great and good in Edinburgh, and then throughout the country. And then after his death, international fame. Eh? But Burns, he reminded us that we've got a country that we should be rightly proud of. And he reaffirmed our culture, and uh, reaffirmed our culture and our heritage. The poetic genius of our country found me the clue and threw a romantic and uh, threw an inspiring mantle over me. She bade me sing the loves, the joys of rural scenes and rural pleasures of my native soil in my native tongue. Burns was effectively a social commentator. He wrote about the people he met, the things that happened to him. He wrote in simple language. You didn't need to be an academic scholar. 
You didn't need to have a university education. You didn't need to have an understanding of the classics. It had universal appeal. To all the seas gang dry, my dear, and the rocks melt with the sun. And I will love thee still, my dear, while the sands of life shall run. Thirty simple words, each one a monosyllable, yet when joined together, what a picture, beautiful, everlasting love. No wonder he was success, so successful with a man. But it's the songs, I think he deserves an awful lot of credit for the songs and immortality for the songs because after his success in Edinburgh, Burns toured the country and he collected folk songs, old Scots songs, and he mended these songs, he edited these songs, he rewrote these songs, new lyrics, and he did this primarily for two collections, uh, Johnson's Scots Musical Museum and for George Thompson's collection. And he did this for nothing. He saw this almost as a, a labour of love. It was his duty to his country. And he was protecting our, preserving our heritage. And the songs, my goodness, the songs, ye Jacobites by name, war songs, rallying cries, Scots were he. Yet he wrote about the, he wrote about brotherly love and the futility of war. But it's the love songs that probably uh, is most famous for. Had we never loved so blindly, had we never loved so kindly, never met or never hearted, never been broken hearted. Bob Dylan, one of my heroes, when asked uh, which lyric had inspired him the most, stated Burns, my love is like a red, red rose. Michael Jackson, so-called king of pop, I don't think so, however, he had recorded uh, an album's worth of Burns material that has been donated to the Robert Burns Birthplace Museum. Burns hit Broadway in 2016 in the musical Life and Works of Robert Burns. Apparently the Michael Jackson uh, thriller, a uh, musical video, was based on Tam Shanter. My good friend Mr Valenti at the Air Brewing Company keeps Burns alive with his beers, his Lazy Lundy IPA, his Jolly Beggars, his Rabbi's Porter, his Dr Hornbook Imperial Blonde Stout, sometimes known as Orec the Hoose the Juice. <laughs> The Aaron Ar Ar Distillery across there produces a Robert Burns malt. He's adorned stamps, banknotes. God, he even has appeared on a bottle of Coke, the real thing. He appeared in the Coca-Cola bottle to commemorate his 250th birthday. The only other person that's appeared on a bottle of Coke is Santa. <laughs> and I don't think he's real. <laughs> Burns knew that his world and our world is full of contradictions. Privilege for some and pain for others. Now we've had a fantastic meal tonight in a wonderful setting, yet in Ayrshire at the moment there will be people visiting food banks in increasing numbers. Burns knew poverty, he knew pain, but he always felt that people would pull together to support the weakest. He had self pride he knew the value of an education, he loved the passes, he liked that point, uh, he loved his country. He had a passion for his country and his fellow man. He detested cruelty and hypocrisy. His message transcends class, religion, race, colour. He expressed the thoughts and hopes of the people. He was, and still is, uh, our poet, our people's poet. And that's because I think he always wrote from the heart. He could understand people. Uh, he understood countryside, nature. Then let us pray that come it may, as come it will for all that. For all that and all that, it's coming yet for all that. That man to man, the world hour, shall brothers be for all that. What a message. It's a message of friendship. It's a message of human equality. It's a message of truth and love of your fellow man. Is he still relevant? I certainly think so. Kofi Annan also thinks so. Former General UN Secretary once said, if we are to survive the destructive threats, and I quote, facing mankind in the 21st century, then we must begin by promoting the brotherhood of man and the tolerance and wisdom promulgated by Robert Burns 
the world's leading lyric poet. Are you listening, Donald J. Trump? <laughs> Mrs. May, that bad boy in North Korea. Burns did more than any person, in my opinion, to preserve the language, the culture, the heritage, I, the very heart and soul of our country. So this is to Robert Burns, a man of passion, a man of freedom and independence, a man of verse and song, a man of the people. It is to Scotland's native son and national bard that I ask you to charge your glasses and be upstanding to the immortal memory of Robert Burns. Robert Burns. Thank you. Oh, well done.